Cut my life into pieces. This is my last resort. No uh, th- don't give a fuck if I cut my arm bleeding. <laughs> This is my last resort. Oh, that, that, dude, you're killing it. Amazing. I just want to give the audience a little so taste. That's, that's last resort. My name's Chris Bussing. Welcome to my podcast. It's committed to helping more people create lives of freedom and impact through success in tech sales and the pursuit of self-development, creativity, and self-expression. I've got an amazing guest today, Anthony Esperance. Esperance, my buddy in Papa Roach, working on his biggest artistic project yet as an independent artist, Future Hands. We're going to talk about his journey into Papa Roach and being a rock star, what he's working on with Future Hands, the vision, the mission, the five-year plan, and we're going to learn about what it takes to be successful as an artist, his creative process, and some success habits as well along the way. Stay for the full conversation to be entertained and to learn on your own journey to reaching your potential. Anthony, thank you so much for being here, man. So Thank good to you have for you. having me, and that intro was impressive. What? That intro was very sweet, and I feel like a rock star when I'm around you. I feel like a rock star. Like a rock what, star. What do you think of um, Post Malone? Have you have you ever met him? Or it... no, but I would love to meet Post Malone. I'm a huge fan of Post Malone. Um, I think he's a very, very talented artist and he's got a very unique voice because that thing he does with his voice, that like Billy Goat, nah, you know oh, what I'm yeah. saying? Dude, you just did it, that's sick. I like didn't a, even know. Ah, like Billy Goat kind of thing. That's, at first when I heard it, I thought it was odd, but now it's like, it's his thing and people love it. I think that's pretty ballsy. So who are some artists that you have met in person that you really admire that it was kind of like a dream come true to like oh. spend time with them? Just happened last year. Um, A band called the 1975. They are a UK-based alt-rock band. I'm a huge fan of their singer, Matt Healy. And we got to play a festival with the 1975, I think somewhere near Prague. Uh, It was Czech Republic. And he came up to side stage and shook me and my brother's hand and thanked us for being on the side stage to watch his set. And I thought that was so classy of him because mm. you don't have to do that when you're a, a star like him. But uh, I love his music and I love him. And he came and shook our hands and said, thank you. So it just made it 10 times better. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, to hear that he's a class act like that, um, I feel like some of the most successful people, whether it's in music, sports, or business, they're very humble. I you know, agree. That says a lot. I agree. Most are, dude. Most are are, are good sweet, hardworking people. So it just reinforces why you're doing it when you meet, you know, your idol who's also, you know, kicking ass but being humble at the same time. Yeah. And speaking of meeting your idol, and I'm kind of tongue in cheek here, <laughs> but uh, it's funny how we met in Austin. We're at a guy's get together, a, a group of dudes that were, the, the theme was the entrepreneurial, having conversations, having stakes. And uh, we're over at the Marlowe in Austin. Some man stuff right there. Oh yeah. Very manly. Uh, get together. <laughs> but uh, I remember uh, seeing you and uh, you just seemed like a great guy. That was my first impression. And it turned out to be the truth. But I, of course, we talked about, oh, what do you do? And you said you're in a band. And I said, what band? And when you said Papa Roach, I was like a, a fangirl all of a sudden. I, I just, I love rock so much. Ever since I was a kid, I started like, listening to Linkin Park. And I remember my mom was like, you know, I came from a Christian uh, conservative household. She's like, oh, no, you know, we need to get you listening to like Christian rock and take you to the Christian bookstore. But uh, I started getting into that world and uh, I freaking love rock. And to meet someone like you in, in, in the band was just a dream come true. And um, it was a cool moment. It was a cool moment. And, it, and your humility is something that I've really admired because you're traveling, you know, across the world. Um, it's amazing to see your board in your house with like pins dropped across Mm -hmm. the map and um so i definitely noticed that humility with you and how how have you grown from like you know traveling so much uh in terms of touring and everything and and bouncing around the globe and and putting yourself out there on stage so much bro like 
when I look back to myself as a young man, so like I joined the Papa Roach crew in 2012, right? I was 22 years old. And up until that point, you know, I was a social guy. I had friends, but like I had a lot of anxieties about the world and I was, I, I was shy. It's kind of interesting. Like I was an extrovert introvert. Yeah. But touring just knocks all that down because you're, you're touring all these different countries and these different cultures and meeting different groups of people. And you're also working with different types of people on the touring world, you know, like the crew. So I had some dudes that were these hard ass guys that had been on touring, uh, parties since they like the eighties, right. Who were like calloused and like tough. And then you had new guys. And so I just learned a lot about who I am as a man. And, and to be honest, I was very calloused myself going through touring because I was a part of the crew before I joined the band. I don't know if a lot of people know that about me, but I started my way at the bottom as a crew guy and worked my way into the position I am today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to dig more into that. It's an amazing story of working your way into the band and it's relatable to people like whether they're um, in sports and they're trying to like walk onto a team in college or yeah. make it professionally. It's relatable in business, um, just getting your foot in the door and uh, rising up, making it happen. So can you walk us through just your trajectory? Like how did, you know, how did you get in the door and how did you like work your way up and to earn, you know, being on stage where I've seen you in Vegas and yeah. in Nashville and all these different cities, like just crushing it up there. So it goes back a long ways because I was talking with my older brother, Tobin, and Tobin is a founding member of Papa Roach. Um, but him and I didn't talk much growing up. We're half brothers. We have the same dad, different moms, grew up in separate states, did not see him much, right? So didn't have much of a relationship with him. But as I got older, you know, 17, 18, 19, we, he was in Papa Roach. I was playing music in Portland, Oregon, and we started talking more. So it started there. It started with me going, hey, man, at some point, I'd love to move to Los Angeles, where he lived at the time, and just get into the scene. Not necessarily with Papa Roach, but just I want to be in LA doing the music thing. And he lived there. So he goes, you know what? Show me that you're serious about music for a couple years, and then we'll consider you coming down to LA, right? Mm. So he kind of put me through, you know, the ringer as far as show me that you are serious about being a musician. And so I started doing singer songwriter competitions in Portland. I started playing weddings. I started playing bars. I started residencies at different restaurants where I would play every Thursday night. Right. So I was showing him, look, I'm taking this serious. And then when I turned 21, he was like, come down and live with me and, and, and start playing gigs. Right. I had no intention of joining the Papa Roach crew. It just so happened that when I moved down there, they needed a studio assistant. They were they were going to make a record in Sacramento, so I went to Sacramento to be the studio assistant, which consisted of uh, buying food, doing the band's laundry, uh, driving them places, just kind of the grunt work of the studio guy. And the whole time, I was um, showing them riffs I was writing, and I was showing them, "Hey, look, I write music too," and they were writing this record with this this awesome producer named James Michael. And so I also felt like a nuisance because I kept saying, hey, check this out, check this out. And they were like working, <laughs> but the persistence paid off because they ended up using one of my riffs and one of my songs on the record. And that song started to do pretty well on the rock charts. So once they saw that I could write, they eventually let me come into the touring world as a drum technician. So they're like, come set up our drums. Uh, come be the the drummer's, you know, assistant. And from there, it went to personal assistant. I tour managed for one tour. I started writing all these extra guitar parts and keyboard parts and harmonies. And finally, in 2017, they said, dude, come join the band because you're writing all this extra stuff. Come play it live. Be a part of the band. Wow. So it was like a five-year climb of, of different positions until I became a band member. You earned the opportunity, you put in the work, you showed you were serious um, over the course of years. You also were the squeaky wheel. I think that's really important, and I see it in corporate America too, like being vocal about your successes and the work you're doing. And it's just very inspiring that uh, you ultimately wrote that hook that 
ended up uh, top in the rock charts. I'm curious, like, what was the hook? What was the song? I mean, do you mind, like, kind of, maybe you could play it? Yeah, I could play it. Actually, yeah, I'll play it. Let me get the guitar. Um, so the song, the song that hit for them in 2012, it's a song that ultimately be became Where Did the Angels Go? Yeah. That's the name of the track. But the riff, I think what caught the band's attention is that I was into the metalcore scene at the time, and Papa Roach in 2012 was like straight rock band. Yeah, They were coming off of record, I think it was called Paramore Sessions, that was just straight rock and roll. And I was playing more heavy stuff. So I think the riff stood out to them because it's kind of like a bouncy gent. I don't know if you know the, the term gent, but the riff was like... This is not Damn. the right tuning, but that that that's, sounded great though, even without the tuning. And imagine on electric guitar. I'm in, I'm in a standard. It's supposed to be drop D, but basically that bounciness of the riff. It was just something different and more percussive than the band had done before, and I think that's what caught the attention when I played it for him. And you know, I'm a 21 year old kid, right? Like yeah. I'm stoked to have a song with this band that I've looked up to my whole life. Of course, my brother is in the band, but I was a fan of Papa Roach. I was a fan of the aggress the aggressiveness of the music, of Jacoby's heartfelt lyrics. Yeah, the uh, lead singer, man, what passion. Passion like. in that guy. To this day, it hasn't left him. And so I was already a fan of the band, so to be having this song with them was pretty special, and that's what kicked off my whole journey with them. Yeah. Are there any other... Um riffs that you wrote um or contributions you've made to the band that you're very proud of since then yeah dude um like obviously for different reasons i i could choose a bunch but the one that always sticks out to me is a song called falling apart i love that song and falling apart was written uh musically i wrote the music in an airbnb in vegas alone and it was a it was a weekend where the band had gone home to see their families, see their kids and their wives, and I stayed in Vegas where we were making this record. And I just was having this day, this day in my feels, man. Like, uh, do you know the song by Shania Twain? You're still the one. You're still the one. You're still the one that I love. Oh, okay. I was thinking the of the wrong only one. The one I dream. It's like this. Oh, yeah. Man, I, it, okay. Yes. It fucking it gets me in the feels. Can we curse on this podcast? Yeah, we can. Okay. It gets me in the feels, and my parents used to sing that song together in this band. And so I was just like, I was just feeling emotional. And after I listened to Shania Twain's You're Still the One, I picked up the guitar and I wrote Falling Apart. And it's like, if you listen to Falling Apart, there's this emotional pull. It's a heavy song. It's a very metal-heavy driven song, but there's this emotional pull going oh, on. Yeah. And um, I showed it to the guys maybe like the next weekend and they liked it and Jacoby cut vocals on it. And it's one of my favorite contributions to Papa Roach. I love that song so much. Okay. Can we like, can we play it? Is it, you know, could you riff yeah. on it? Yeah. yeah. Falling yeah. apart. By the way, what just happened is I, I dropped the pick in the acoustic guitar. Oh shoot. So let's see if on camera I can get it out first try. Yeah. That's the classic challenge. Maybe you can edit it so it looks like I do it the first try. <laughs> or. We're keeping it the way it is. Or I can just play it without. Oh, it's right here, guys. Come on. Yes. Dude, that's skill. That's years of experience. That usually takes way longer. Yeah. Um, I'll get the mic as close as I can. Okay, so falling apart is in drop D. So it would be like. So that's that's the rhythm of how we play it on the record, but live we do an acoustic version that's prettier, and it's like. It's 
So that's kind of the music behind it. And then Jacoby, our singer, is obviously singing about, yeah. I will follow you out of the dark. I will, you know, I'm going to be there I'll put, for you. I'm putting you on the spot, but are you comfortable, like, singing it? I know it's like, it's... Uh, um, I don't, well, I could try. All that I see is the wickedness around me. I refuse to believe the apocalypse inside myself. I can't get... I don't remember the words. I'm something in my skin. I'm standing at the gates of hell. Nobody will let me in. Beautiful. I follow you out of the dark. I tried it my way, but I keep falling apart. I follow you with all of my heart. I tried it my way, but I keep falling, I'm falling apart. Dude, so beautiful. And I'm You've a, got I'm, a great voice. I'm not the singer of Papa Roach. Yeah, just, you're not the singer, but like, yeah. you've got a great voice, man. I'm excited to talk more about um, future hands and... I'm curious if you're going to throw any vocals in the uh, future hands. Dude, um, I am. Oh. Because, yeah, you you got that, like, uh, what? how would you describe your own voice? Tuan Mayer. Tuan Mayer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Tuan is a nickname you were given by Jacoby, the lead singer of Papa Roach. Yeah, yeah. Tuan is my nickname in the music world. So anyone in, like, touring parties or the last 10 years of touring calls me Tuan. But yeah, like, I don't know, John Mayer was like a huge inspiration of mine growing up, Jason Mraz. Like my voice, I'll, let's get candid on the podcast right now because something I struggle with is my singing voice with the type of music that I write. Because I tend to write a lot of aggressive music. I'm in a, you know, a hard rock band. Yeah, My Future Hands project has some aggressive electronic elements. And so when I do try to sing on those tracks, I'm like, my voice is just so clean and clear and like, like a baby, you know, a baby voice. And so I'm always like, it doesn't fit. It fits for acoustic. Cause that's what I used to do. I used to go play weddings and birthdays and I would just sing acoustic songs. But now that I'm more aggressive with my music, it doesn't really fit. So I'd rather have someone else sing on it yeah. or have an AI <laughs> robot sing something on it. You know what I mean? Yeah what you can do nowadays. That's crazy that you can do that. What is a song that you would um, sing when you're in your wedding days that you loved? Oh my God, I loved Goo Goo Dolls. Yeah. Iris, that song Iris. Dude, can you please sing a little bit of it? Like, because you're so talented, like. I don't want to. Those days are behind me. The Iris days are. I'll tell you past. what, I'll tell you what I used to sing though. Yeah. And uh, I learned a lot from a friend of mine named Jordan up there. So I would, when I started playing gigs, I started playing the songs that I liked, which I was into some weird stuff. I was into a band called Say Anything, and Say Anything would sing lyrics that are really messed up. Like one of their lyrics is, I called her on the phone and I touched myself, I touched myself. That's the chorus to one of their songs. I was singing that type of song in a bar of people that didn't want to hear that shit. And I happened to be into that type of music at the time. I thought it was funny, I thought it was comedic. But you have to you have to play to the audience. You have to play to what the people want to hear. Mm. And my friend Jordan, who was a singer songwriter in Portland at the time, he was playing R and B hits. He was playing "This Is How We Do It." The place would freaking erupt. Yeah. And then he'd play an Adele song, and the place would erupt. And then he'd and I was like, oh, I need to play what they want to hear, not what I want to play. Oh. So he taught me. Like a DJ, right? You have to play the songs that are the current hits, the classic hits, and do your own spin on it. So I stopped playing all these weird emo songs that people didn't want to hear, and I switched up my game to Goo Goo Dolls and whatever else at the time. Wow, what a great lesson. Like, we've been getting a lot of lessons from you that apply to all aspects of life, but you mentioned playing not what felt good to you but what the audience wanted to hear you have to and do. it's the same in sales like you what you're not like doing what makes you feel good but fo having empathy to focus on the customer and what what they need what they <laughs> what they want to hear yeah and so that's just such a good insight right there it is good insight it changed the game for me and uh, uh uh this patron at one of the bars once was he was being nice he came up to me after a set and very nicely was like you need to pick different songs and I was offended because I was like, well, I love these songs. I was singing all these very underground, not well-known, independent artists, like avant-garde songs. No one knew what they were. 
And this guy's like, why don't you try singing something that everyone knows? And I was like, fuck that. Like, I'm going to do what I want. Doesn't work that way. You have to play to the audience. Can you talk about your creative process? You know, you wrote some amazing riffs uh, for Papa Roach. Your songs for Future Hands, like Throw It Back, which we'll talk about more later, are bangers. They're amazing. And there's so much that goes into these songs. Like, what is your process to, to write a song dare I say, from, you know, start to finish? My process has and it always has been a spark of inspiration that comes into my mind randomly. So what I mean by that is instead of sitting down in my studio and saying, I'm going to write a song today, the inspiration of a melody or a drum beat will pop into my head while I'm getting out of the shower, while I'm at the grocery store, while I'm on a run, and I will remember that that loop, right? It's looping in my head. And then I take it to the studio and then whatever that thing in my head is, I get it down. And from there, the rest of the song blossoms. Okay, I'm gonna add a hi-hat, I'm gonna add a kick, I'm gonna add a bass. So there's just constant melodies swimming around in there and I'll usually voice note them in my phone and then take it to the studio. And from there, the song blossoms. So sometimes a riff will come from noodling around, just playing on the guitar and I'll go, oh, what was that? right and I'll catch it and record it but most of the time I kind of I kind of do everything in my head first mm. cuz I'll hear the song in layers I'll be like okay I got this vocal melody I can already hear the chord progression behind it I can hear what bass notes are behind that okay got that and now the beat cool that's that's easy and then I take it to my little workstation and I just let it let it rip so you're the genius behind uh, my name's Chris Bussing and Tech Sales is Bussing and uh, my song, uh, Smile and Dial, which is even better. People are loving it, uh, the ones that Those I've shared it with. Those are two great songs, man. Right, and uh, so thank you so much for sharing your talents um, with me. You know, I, I come up with some lyrics and a concept, and you just turn it into something amazing. And so, like, my name's Chris Bussing, and Textiles Bussing is kind of like a... How, how would you describe that one? The, I, we had talked about it being like a 50-cent-style rap, but, like, what was your thinking... On that piece, and then it, we could talk a little bit about Smile and Dial as well. Okay, so um, my name's Chris Bussing, and I'm glad that you're here. I think what we wanted to accomplish on that one was like your flex song, like the statement, because it was your first song as a tech sales dude, which is which is an interesting thing to to market to use as marketing. Yeah. but it's a great idea too. So I was like, let's do the flex track, is what it's called, right? Where people are just like. Dang, this guy's intense. Like this is this is what he's all about. Um, I wanted it to be fun. I wanted it to be to be punchy, and um, so you had already you know voice noted your lyrics and your your cadence, but I was like, let's make it more hip hop because I feel like everyone loves hip hop. Yeah, I feel like everyone gets into hip hop, and so that was a good first song for you to grab the attention of the viewer. And then Smile and Dial, which hasn't been released yet. People will hear it's it's a bit more mellow and heartfelt. Yeah. yeah. So I think we're going in the right direction with these two genres. Yeah. It's funny in the music video for My Name's Chris Bussing and Textiles is Bussing, I was wearing this exact shirt I wear today. You are. You and, are. Uh, yeah. And it was recorded out here at, at Squatch Fitness where we're, uh, you know, we have this great podcast set up and the, the gym over across the way and um, brings back the feels, man. You, you took um, what I had and you... You made it so much better. It's amazing to have a friend to be able to synergize with like yourself. Um, and Smile and Dial is just amazing. So one thing that I feel is so important in life is to surround yourself with great friends. And for me, I'm fortunate to have you in my bouquet of friendship flowers. My mom always uh, said your friendships are like a bouquet of flowers, you know, and choose them well. So I love that metaphor. And, and it doesn't uh, hurt that we're in Austin, which is such a great community. So... Can you share like the importance of like community and also just your experience in Austin and what you love about this um, city? Dude, community is everything. Um, I've been talking to a couple of buddies recently that live back home in Oregon and they're going through some really tough times right now. And and both of them in particular are pretty isolated. They're, they're not going out. They're not meeting new people. Um, and I keep telling them your community is what's going to bring you out of this funk. And there's people out there in every city that, you know, can be your family and don't underestimate, you know, the power of 
just stepping outside and taking a walk, going to a coffee shop, you never know who you're going to run into that's going to be your next best friend. Case in point, you and me yeah. meeting at this guy's dinner. I mean, I was invited by our good friend Jay to go to a, a all men's dinner where you just kind of talk about whatever you want, get away from your house for a little bit, have a dinner, meet people in the in the community. I met like five dudes from there that I still talk with, right? And you won't meet these people unless you put yourself out and, and leave your home and go do it. Um, and so Austin has only been that since I moved here. I meet someone like you, like Jay, like my friend Justin, like my friend Julian, and they then introduced me to five more people. And then they introduced me to another five people. And this, this <coughs> excuse me, family of of friends starts growing and it's all these people you can call on in a tough time. It's all these people that have your back when you need, you know, you leave for a week and you need your dog taken care of, your house taken care of. Like community is your family. And not that I didn't have it in Los Angeles because that's Los Angeles is where I came from when I moved here. But I feel like it, there's more of it in Austin. It's a smaller city. Everyone's a little bit more close knit. And um, I've met a bunch of amazing people here. They're wholesome. Uh, the people of Austin are genuine and wholesome people. One of the first things me and my girlfriend noticed when we moved here is just how people would walk up to us and they would know that we were out-of-towners. They're like, you from out of town? I'd be like, yeah. They're like, where? I'm at California. They're like, that's cool. Welcome. Hey, there's a great uh, brisket taco truck up the way. You got to go try it. I'm like, you wouldn't get this in Los Angeles. Yeah. No one's like, hey, welcome to our city. Uh, go try this food. No, dude, like it's different in Los Angeles. Austin is here for you and are pretty damn welcoming. Mm. Austin is here for you. And yes, it is welcoming and where you have people that are proactively recommending places to check out like taco trucks just to make sure you have food, a good time when they, when they don't need to. So I just remember when... Um, I came to Austin for the first time to visit to decide if I wanted to move here from Boston. At the time, I was drinking. We're going to talk about both of us have given up drinking, um, and uh, that'll be a good topic for us to hit on. But uh, I had a beer that I was not quite done with, and um, I went up to the bouncer, and I had trauma from my Boston days that were the bouncers are really oh, I brutal, and um, I, I was just shocked and refreshed when the bouncer's like, hey, take your time, finish your beer. I was like, wow, this Austin okay, place is something. That's something I want to touch on real quick. Stuff like that, the bouncer at the bars here, the the people at the UPS store here, the people at the DMV here. I used to have the worst experiences in California with all these types of people and businesses. I mean, rude, like in bad moods. And I get it, like maybe it's not the job you want to be in, whatever the case is, but I had so many people that were complete assholes in California. And then I come to Austin and it's like, I went to a UPS store here where not only was there not a line, uh, but the lady had made fresh baked like muffins from her home that she was giving to the customers just because she wanted to be nice. So here I am walking to send a package. She goes, hey, I made these gluten-free banana nut muffins. Would you like one? I'm like, you're giving us snacks at the UPS store? Like Texas is awesome. And, and uh, that's the big difference I've noticed here is, is the workers are in good moods. They're happy, just like your bouncer story. That's, that's why I'm sticking around, dude. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here and that Austin brought us together. Um, oh, my gosh. What are other places that you've traveled to through uh, touring that you love? Because I know you've gone across the globe. I'm blown away by all the your, your like poster in your house that we have all those pins dropped and like the whole globe is basically covered practically. So what are some of the greatest places that you've gone um, in your travels? So the ones that stick out, I mean, Europe as a whole is my favorite place on earth. So I can't really pick one of the countries, but just Europe and UK has my heart. Um, I love London. I love Amsterdam. is is probably one of my probably my top city that I've ever been to, just because of the canals and you can you can ride bikes along the canals. And um, the first time I went there, it was like a postcard. It was Christmas and it was snowing on the town, and there was these Christmas markets happening where they were selling this thing called mold wine. It's this cinnamon spiced wine and everyone was jolly and merry. And I just like had this picture in my head of the first time I went to Amsterdam and got to walk around and shop. And I'm like, it's so different than the United States. It's so different. It's old, it's rich in culture. Um, but one place that really stands out from tour is St. Petersburg, Russia. 
St. Petersburg, Russia is on another level of architecture and, and food. Um, dude, it's just, it blows my mind that I get to go travel to these places. Uh, we did South America, all of South America. We hit every country, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Santiago, uh, that's a city, Chile, Argentina, um, Uruguay, Paraguay. We hit everything there. Uh, that was, a, that was an incredible trip. So my favorites, it, it's, it's Europe. Europe is my favorite. I remember when I studied abroad in Madrid, Spain, and I just had the greatest time ever. And then I was in Berlin, Germany on a train and I overheard an American girl say, oh my gosh, like I never want to go back to America again or Europe is so much better. And I do think um, it's easy to fall in love with Europe. It's a yes, special it place, the history, the culture, the food, um, the people. And it's amazing that um, you've been able to travel the whole world, um, including all pockets of Europe. And St. Petersburg is one I wouldn't have thought of in Russia. You're saying that actually well, really stood out. It's a gorgeous city. And and the interesting thing about it is that when I first went to Russia with Papa Roach was in 2012, right when I started working for the band. One of my first tours, we went to Russia, but we went to all the the lesser known cities. So Moscow, St. Petersburg, those are the big cities where people speak English, right? We went to all the cities where they do not speak English. So getting around, getting on trains and planes was next to impossible because no one understood us. We had to have these two handlers, we called them, Vadim and Vladimir, and they were our translators. I'm talking any coffee shop I walked into, any restaurant, I had to have Vadim and Vladimir with me because no one would understand me, nor would they really want to serve me because I'm this American. And these small, these small cities, bro, it was just like, it was in the middle of winter too, so it was brutal. So my first experience in Russia was tough. It was a really tough tour to get through. And then the next time we went, we did St. Petersburg and Moscow, which are beautiful cities. They, they know that there's gonna be American tourists. They're a bit more welcoming. And I had a great time. So that's when I fell in love with St. Petersburg was the second tour with Papa Roach. Yeah. If you had to choose like your favorite crowd to play for across the globe. Oh, dude. Uh, yeah. What Mexico. Is it? Really? Mexico. Okay. Tell, tell us why. Mexico City. Uh, they are avid rock fans. Like most cities, you know, it, it are kind of the same where they they love Drake and they love like Skrillex and they love like EDM and hip hop and that's like the and pop Taylor Swift right those three are like the biggest genres. Mexico City loves rock and roll. Mexico City when we went, we played a festival uh, with Maroon Five actually was headlining. oh that's cool I oh, they, I mean. Maroon Five. Uh, oh shoot! What's his first name? He's Adam Levine. Adam. Oh gosh. Yeah, he, he's incredible. He's incredible. Did you spend time with him? No, no. But I, me and my brother walked and and watched their set in the crowd oh, cool. at this festival. And I can't say enough good things about that band live, dude. They are incredible live. Wow. But it was a festival where you know here's Papa Roach, you know Hard Rock, and then we had Maroon Five and Kings of Liam were on the same uh, stage. Well. Just same festival, maybe not the same stage. Yeah, but the point is, Mexico loves rock. They all had Metallica T-shirts on, and they were circle pitting. We actually played an acoustic set the night before our main set, and everyone was screaming back the lyrics. They were moving in the crowd, doing mosh pits on on our acoustic set. So I just saw the passion of the people in Mexico. I love playing for Mexico and Germany, Germany too, and so. Mexico and Germany, das gut. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so what's the hit that everyone loves? Or like, I mean, I, I think I'm kind of leading you on here, but uh, there's one in particular I think of. And uh, But what are the top songs that like people go nuts for from when it, Papa Roach, when you guys are on stage? Well, obviously, Last Resort is the band's biggest hit. Yeah. And Last Resort is like, dude, it's a freaking... Culture, it's part of our culture. Can we can we play it real quick? I yeah. guess I'll, I'll do the I'll do the vocal. Uh, but okay. uh, you know, a quick story on this is that one when I, I did was, not have anything to do with this song. This song was written when I was eight years old. This is crazy. But this is all the band. Hey, dude. when I was getting my permit, like going through driver's ed at a high school, um, the gym teacher leading and instructing us would have this come on. On it was his like ringtone on his phone. 
Um, and uh, dude, when I tell people, do you know Papa Roach? And they're like, oh no. And then I, we say this song, they're all of a sudden they're like, oh my gosh, I know it. So, so you, you know the intro. Go ahead. Chris can start the intro. Cut my life into pieces. This is my last resort. <laughs> Uh, th don't give a fuck if I come by, I'm bleeding. <laughs> this is my last resort. Oh, no, no. Uh, dude, you're killing it. Amazing. I just want to give the audience a little so taste. So that's, that's last resort. Because you know what? What's your demographic on your YouTube? If you've got uh, some so Gen Z, so we've got they ain't twenty to, shit. according to the data, mostly twenty to thirty somethings. Okay, so they definitely know the song. Yeah, so they, they know, they know. I'm sorry to tarnish it that way, so, but uh, dude, it was cool to hear you actually riff and play the um, the I song. I wonder how this is gonna like, sound on this mic, but it's the guitar stuff. But it's fine either way. The song "Last Resort" um, is the one that goes off. One of the ones that goes off the most. A song of ours called "Born for Greatness." Yeah, goes off, and I I believe that's because it's got a shuffle beat to it. Do, 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 ka, do, 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 ka. It's like yeah, something, yeah. something that Pop Roach, we don't do that often. So the shuffle beat is great for live. Dead Cell is a song that, excuse me, goes off uh, live. Is that a newer one or is it Dead old? Okay, Dead Cell. Dead Cell is old. It's from uh, Infest, the band's first album. Okay, I probably know it. I needed, like, we got some homework. I need to listen to it again. But, yeah, that uh, one goes off. Help goes yep. off. Um, Between Angels and Insects goes off. Uh, kill the noise goes off. You know, for the most part, the cool thing about being in a band with these dudes is that they have such a long history, like catalog history of songs to choose from. So we, our set is songs that the band released in 2001, 2005, 2010, 2017, and 22. Like it's Unreal. the span of like 20 years of music that we get to play and it still hits. And it's cool because different, you know, demographics come in and, and, you know, younger kids, older, older folks will come in and hear the songs and then they go back and listen to the, the back catalog and become fans. And it's really cool to be able to play with such good songwriters and, and musicians. Yeah. I love that song. I think I need help. Yeah, dude. Da, 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 da. Dude, it, 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 what goes into writing a song that is timeless that lasts for decades and decades. I, that's a loaded question, but like, what can you try and extract some of the magic of like what leads to an well, amazing and timeless song? I can try, but the I think any songwriter will tell you that the magic just happens. It's not it is not planned. You can't come into a session and say I'm going to write magic today. Yeah, it's something about you and the writers in that room and the feeling in your heart that day. What's on your mind? I mean, a really cool thing for me lately is that I've been getting more into lyrics. The, the Pretty much my whole career, I've been the music dude. Yeah. I write the guitar, bass, and drums, and keys. But now I'm writing lyrics, and it's like, what have I learned this last week that I could write about that meant something to me? And so now it's exciting for me to write lyrics because it's like, what's in my heart today? And it's that's like the expression. That's what's getting all the emotion out of me is writing these things down. But with that song, Help, that was a very special uh, session. That was four band members, our two producers, Colin and Nick, who we love working with. And we picked up an acoustic guitar. I think my brother started riffing on the, the help kind of riff. And uh, we all were just shouting ideas. I have a voice note on my phone of the session that I placed. And it's Nick yelling a line, Jacoby screaming a different line. I'm kind of barking like, well, what if we tried it like this? Wow. And it's chaos. It's oh, just, my God. It's this beautiful chaos of everyone's shouting ideas. And, okay, take that chord progression, but flip it. Do the G chord before the book. And it's like this madness. And then to hear what the finished product is, it's it's pretty special. But that, like, I'm glad I hit record on my phone that day because you can hear an energy in our voices as we're writing help. That is so cool to hear what was behind writing a song like that. 
and the creative process and that you just the magic you don't really choose when it happens but when it hits you you just gotta write it down and and run with it so i want to um shift shortly to talking about future hands your latest artistic project that i'm so excited about i'm loving the music like throw it back and excited for uh, the new song you're about to release that you'll tell us about but um i guess one other question related to um your travels and touring it's like what does it feel like to be on stage in front of monster crowds because i was in vegas seeing you on on stage at this um huge festival i mean just a sea of people and you were killing it up there with the whole group and like what does that feel like to be on stage if it's feels different now than it did when i started and the reason is is because I think what people don't understand is that I went from not playing shows to playing with Papa Roach in front of 50,000 people. I had a big learning curve um, of how to deal with being on a stage. Not that I was nervous. Like people always ask me, are you nervous to go on stage? I'm never nervous because I'm so focused on the parts that I have to nail during the set that I'm kind of just thinking about my instruments, to be honest. And that's the point I'm getting to. My first like five years in the band, I was just thinking about my keyboard parts, my guitar parts, and my percussion parts. I wasn't even looking at the crowd. I wasn't pointing at fans and feeling their energy because I was thinking about my instruments because I wanted to play everything solid for the band, right? Now I've let go of that. I know my parts so well now. It's like second nature. It's muscle memory. Now I look up, I look at people, I smile, I point, I do my thing, and now I, I... take the energy in of the people and playing has never been better. Playing on stage with them, with Papa Roach has never been better than it is right now. Wow. You took a leap to um, playing in front of 50,000 people and now you're at a point where it's so comfortable and it's so automatic with what you play that you can focus on the audience and really connecting with them. And it's just so fun to see you up there. I have videos on my phone of like, Anthony, you're my hero. Like (laughs) they talking in the background and, uh, I love seeing you at the end of the performances, you know, waving to the crowd. Thank you. Thank you. Taking the bow with the, uh, the bow is a great moment the, too with the band. So yeah. it's a beautiful moment. So I, I do have some more questions. I, I'm full of them on, uh, just, you know, some of your habits like to like care for yourself. Cause you're traveling with like when you're on tour, you're traveling like crazy. And, and just in general, I think like you're in a space where you need to cultivate um, the energy and the creativity to show up as the best version of yourself, produce the grace, greatest work. So like, what are fundamental habits that keep, um, Anthony Esperance, you know, primed and, and, and functioning at his best? Sobriety is the number one habit <laughs> because yeah. touring has changed for me, dude. Like touring, you know, in my twenties and back in the day when I was a drinker was a blast. It was fun but it wasn't good for me. Like I was staying up late, you know, having drinks, eating crappy food. I'd wake up the next day late in the day and a little foggy. And it's like, you're just kind of like trudging your way through tour. Now it's like a beautiful experience because I, you know, I'm 34 and I take my rest very seriously. So a good night's sleep is huge for me on tour. I'm the first one in my bunk on the bus. Uh, diet has to stay relatively healthy. You got to enjoy things every now and again, right? But 75% of my diet is fairly clean. Always hit a workout. I mean, seven days a week. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, it, even if it's an active recovery day and it's just a, a huge walk. Um, fitness is a huge part of what keeps me sane on the road. So like a typical day is I wake up now at like 9 a.m., which is hilarious because when I started, I was waking up at 1 p.m. Wow. Right? Like dragging out of my bed hungover. Now I'm up at 9, cup of coffee, start working on Future Hands music, uh, Future Hands content. I usually hit a coffee shop, whatever city we're in, I go find the best coffee shop, which is my favorite part of touring, you guys, is, okay, where am I? Minneapolis? All right, what's the best coffee shop? Okay, it's a two-minute walk. I'm going and I take my stuff, my headphones, and I sit in the coffee shop and I work on future hands or whatever artistic thing I want to work on. But um, yeah, then I get a workout. I do sound check with the guys. Um, I call my sponsors. I have sponsors in the program. Um, play a badass show and get some rest and go to bed. That's my day now on tour and I couldn't be more happy with it. Mm. 
One of the biggest insights from what you just shared is that in order to like reach our potential in life and live fully, it's often about what we give up, you know, and both of us gave up drinking. And I'm so glad to have a, a great and dear friend to keep me accountable on this journey. Um, dude, you're a shining light. You're so talented. You have so much to give to this world. And uh, we're going to segue to talking about future hands and that contribution in a second. Um, but uh, it, it's just great to see like you giving up drinking. It's inspired me. And um, it's cool to hear about the habits that um, you implement every day to show up as your best self. And like coffee shops are, you know, the a must. I love coffee that's an, so that's much. A, a, I wouldn't say it's a healthy habit, but it's a better habit than drinking alcohol. <laughs> yeah. I, I say, you know, for me, I'll speak for myself, like I choose my addictions. And uh, if uh, if coffee is a vice paired with ice baths and, and working out, then yeah. That's a, that's a good one to have, and um, it, it is something to be enjoyed. And uh, real quick, like, is there a coffee shop that's your favorite here in Austin? Uh, yeah. And what's funny about it is it's in a grocery store, so it's called Foxtrot. Oh yeah, that's a cool um, one. Foxtrot is a like higher end healthy grocery store, but there's a coffee shop, and the one on South First is my favorite. My my girlfriend found it, I think maybe online, like TikTok or something, but. It's just cool to go and sit and see everyone. Everyone's working on something. Uh, Foxtrot's my favorite. There's one called um, Radio, Radio Coffee. Yeah. And Radio Coffee East is closer to where I live. And it's kind of like this outdoor, I don't know, just like an outdoor vibe with Airstreams and, and taco trucks and whatever. Those are probably my favorite. And then just touring around the world and finding coffee shops is one of the best things that you can do, man, because it's just, it's part of their town and their cultures. You can see what they're about. Yeah. I was just visiting a friend in Greenville, South Carolina, and I discovered this underground coffee shop. And I mean, I didn't discover it. He knew of it. Then he knew I like coffee. And they had this great nitro brew and just taking in the, um, obviously the coffee was great in the atmosphere and then seeing the people and what they were like. I, I think that is like a pro move when you travel the world, travel around the country is to check out the local coffee shops and um, gosh, like... Cheers to having good coffee. Cheers. We're, yeah. we're sipping on cold beer right now. Yeah, from Flitch. Shout out to Flitch. So let's talk about um, Future Hands. It's uh, I, I, how, how did you conceive Future Hands? How did it come to you? And what does it really stand for, the, the Future Hands? What is it all about? So Future Hands, the way the name came to me was funny because I was sitting with my roommate in Los Angeles. This was probably 2018. And I have all these demos on my computer that I've written over the years. And I was going through demos to try and get inspiration. And one of the demos was titled Future Hands. And I didn't recall why I had called it that. And I, I was looking for a band name. I'd been looking for a band name for myself because I knew I was going to start a solo project. And I yelled to Bryce in my roommate. I'm like, what do you think of Future Hands? And he's a hard critic. He's like, He's a friend that always cuts through the bullshit with me and tells me what he thinks is good or is not good. And he went, I really like that. So when Bryson said, I like that, I went, that's cool. Because a, a band name is a hard thing to nail. I went through, dude, like hundreds. And I went through like the band name generators. And it just was not, nothing stuck, but Future Hands meant something to me. And so I went, all right, let me go marinate on this. What does it mean to me? And I went, I got it. Future Hands, what, what are you going to build with your tomorrow? We build everything with our hands, right? We build the tallest skyscrapers and buildings. We build hospitals. When children are born, they're born into the hands of the doctor. We write music and poetry with our hands. It's how we express ourselves. So Future Hands is a call to action of what are you going to build with your tomorrow? Mm. What are you going to do? What are you going to What are you going to make? And I thought that was a very special embodiment of the of the word Future Hands. And so the project is just that, man. It's me It's me calling myself out. What am I going to do? What song am I going to write today? What art am I going to make today to give to people? So it's constantly, my, my band name is constantly reminding me that I need to, to give, right, and build. Amen. I love the theme of generosity. I think that's why we're on this earth, to give, to contribute, to lift people up, put a smile on their face, to get them dancing. You know, and uh, your, your song "Throw It Back" certainly does that for me. It hits hard. So let's talk about that first single, um, th "Throw It Back," and I encourage the audience to check it out. I've linked uh, Future Hands on Spotify in the description of this video. 
but uh, walk us through, you know, whatever comes from the heart on what you want to share about that song, what it means to you, how you created it. Um, this is this is a great segue to into independent artist artistry, because Future Hands, the project, I'm using more loops, and loops for people that don't know are pre-made musical arranged loops that producers have made and put on websites such as splice is a huge one where essentially you can type in any instrument trombone vocal bass and you go through and it's these pre-done uh, musical pieces that you can download and up until future hands i didn't use those i used my inspiration um sat down with the guitar and, and kind of fiddled around till i found something but now i i've let go of this constraint I put on myself as a musician where I said, well, loops are cheating. Uh, using AI vocals is cheating. It's not, it's just another tool. It's another way to get inspiration because Throw It Back started from the vocal loop. I was on a website called Splice and this vocal loop says, I throw it back, uh, I throw it back, simple. And I went, I like that. And I pulled it into the session and from there, I built everything around it myself. I built the bass line, I built the beat, I built the keys, right? So I started using loops, which for a long time, I was like, you can't touch those, Anthony. You gotta be a true musician and everything needs to come from your mind. It's just not true anymore. And a lot of people use them. And it spawned some of my favorite songs I've written, right? And if I think if you look at loops as, I'm just collaborating with this producer that wrote this for me. If you look at it that way, you're still collaborating with another artist on the song. And uh, Throw It Back spawned from that one vocal loop and it turned into a freaking pretty cool banger that I put out a month ago and people are seeming to like it. Yeah, I was listening to it before going out in the town in Austin, it got me going. I was listening to it, you know, heading into the gym, got me going, or having to tackle some work in front of me. It's a really great song, man. And You've hit on all these insights that apply to life and sales as well. It's just amazing how the principles of high performance happiness are just, they, they are what they are. And you, you mentioned you're having to let go of feeling like using AI or other loops um, was like a bad thing. You like embraced it and embraced the innovation. And that applies to us in tech sales as well with like chat GPT and other like AI that can help sellers you know, do research and exactly. even just spit out emails that then you can make your own. And it actually can save time. It can lead to innovation. Yeah. And so there's just a good parallel there on embracing technology because I've been resistant. I felt the same way you might have felt about the, I think you said the loops to like AI and sales. I've been kind of resistant. But here's, so. here's why I'm okay with it. And here's my realization is that, you know, I'm 34 years old. I'm not some 18 year old that's just getting into music. I've had all these years of playing the, the crap out of my guitar in my room. I've spent so many hours playing keyboard and creating music myself as an artist. Before loops were invented, before AI, before the internet, I was creating music. So now I know that I always have that. I can always go to my acoustic guitar and write something from my heart. And loops are just a new way of inspiration for me. So I use loops half the time. I'll go through and a loop will inspire me and I'll write a song with it. 50% of the other time, I'm writing it myself from whatever inspiration's in my head. So that's why I feel okay with, with using the new technologies because I have this background of organic artistry. Yes. You've earned the the loops and in sales too, I think of earning automation. There's a lot of tools, but like you do want to build the fundamental skill sets, but then it doesn't hurt to to innovate and uh, use tools at your disposal. Innovate, guys, you know, it's so, 2024. This yeah, is this, how we do things now. This is how we do it. Um, so I wanted to ask you about your other song that you've dropped, because um, I think by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be out. Um, it's coming out this coming Friday. Yes. Um, what's the name of the song, and can you describe like the kind of heart behind that one? Yeah, so the song coming out this Friday and will be out by the time you guys are watching this, it's called Droplets. And Droplets is where Throw It Back was a little bit more, I don't know, it has this jungle house kind of like beat to it. Um, it's a little bit more intense. Uh, Droplets is like kind of hip hop. It's a little bit more like Run the Jewels. Um, it's got kind of a guitar synth riff throughout the whole thing that's 
It's like mid tempo. Um, but droplets, my songs don't really have lyrics. I'm a I'm a producer, right? I'm kind of like a Skrillex. So there's not very many lyrics, but it's just music to move to. It's mu- it's music to uh, to hopefully one day play at you know EDC, yeah, or ACL, and uh, it's a very exciting track. I'm I'm I might be more stoked on Droplets than Throw It Back. Uh, I love the name too, and uh, I'm so excited for it. Gonna be uh, throwing back Droplets, baby. But he uh, oh. hey, so um, talk about the uh, your your five year vision for. Um, future hands. So yeah, and I mentioned five year vision before this podcast for a reason because I think as a new artist you can get really wrapped up in the I need to be well known right now. You know, I need to be I need to have a million subscribers. I need to have I know that it's gonna be a slow grind and and things can happen where you blow up overnight on TikTok, sure, but I just am a realist and I know that I'm also a workhorse, and if I put in five years of tough, like really grinding with future hands, I think I'll be somewhere. And uh, the vision is to to be playing shows. That's the main goal is getting out there and playing this music for people and connecting with people. And my my goal is to bring what I've learned with Papa Roach, the the hard rock show, to EDM. So where an uh, uh, an EDM producer gets up and they have their CDJ, right? They have their little turntable and they do their thing. I wanna have guitar bass drums, big light show, uh, a live drummer doing gospel chops alongside me. And I wanna be in front with a microphone with the crowd engaging. So essentially what Jacoby does on stage, I wanna be that guy for EDM. Wow. I love that you said um, that you think in five years. I'm smiling because with my YouTube, I'm about to hit 4,000 subscribers, which is good, you know, and I haven't like blown up, but it's just been a slow and steady grind over three plus years. And who knows if it'll, you know, blow up in the future, but it just encouraged me because I'm, I'm not, I'm like not even four years in, you know? So now with your talent, man, there's no question that, uh, you're going to blow up and not just your talent, but your heart, like where this is coming from, as you described it, like future hands is of service. It's to light a spark in people to make something of their life, use the hands they have uh, to build a better tomorrow. So yeah. I'm so excited for you, but that's just a, such a good insight and such an encouragement to the audience to think in terms of five years. I would say the same thing for their tech sales career. You're just yeah. getting started. It's going to be a grind. Yeah. But in five years, you could move up and create a lot of like opportunity and really freedom for it's yourself. It's like some people quit after a year. Yeah. And what if, dude, like what if you grinded at your tech sales career or your music career for four years and not much was happening, but the fifth year was the year you were going to blow up and you stopped before that? You know, like you just never know. Like who's the actors? There's There's a a list of actors that got their career started in their 40s and 50s. Yeah. Like Morgan Freeman, I think, was one. And uh, Samuel L. Jackson, I Samuel think. Samuel L. Jackson was older. And then Robert Greene, the perennial best-selling author of like the 48 Laws of Power and some other books, like he bumbled around in his late 30s and his parents were like, like he was like living with them. Yeah. They're like, what are you doing with your life? Yeah. But it, all of his experience shaped him to become what seemed like an overnight success, but it was really just years of what some might consider wandering, but... Wanderers it's are like, not lost. You just have to don't ever stop. Whatever your passion is in your art, don't ever stop because it's just another dart to throw at the bullseye, right? Every year that you keep at it is another dart to throw at the bullseye. And there's all these people you can look up that got their starts in their 50s and 60s. So if you're a 22 year old kid, like bro, you have the whole world in front of you. Yes. Just don't don't ever be the person that gives up because you're discouraged because you didn't get all those followers or listeners. And I think. That's why I f- I'm so happy with Future Hands is I'm like, I'm just going to let it blossom. Like, Let's I go. don't expect a million followers. I don't expect people to buy my merch. Like, maybe in three years. Let's see what happens, right? I'm just happy releasing music. Amen. And I'm just happy giving, you know, giving this gift of music to people. What an inspiration. And I'm just blown away by the parallels from what you do to like the what we talk about on this channel with tech sales and building a successful career. And what's interesting is I started out at Oracle, a big enterprise company, and then Google, and then launched to a startup that's been the most exciting thing yet and starting to explore my entrepreneurial passions and own projects. 
like the YouTube and my tech sales accelerator course. And it's funny that you did a parallel thing in music you got with like the big enterprise company, like Papa Roach in a way. That's funny. You know, isn't that funny? And that it's like, but it sounds like it's prepared you and you've learned things that you're going to take into your own uh, project of, uh, you know, future hands and, and the way you described it, bringing some of those concepts to, uh, being up at stage, engaging with the audience in the electronic space. So could you, uh, I mean, has that, I don't want to project on you, but has that been your experience? It, it just seems like such a parallel that you went, you got like great learnings from Papa Roach and now you're able to take that with you. It wasn't a realization until recently that I went, hold on. I've learned so much in this touring industry that why don't I just take that to my future hands project and not just stage presence and um, playing in front of big crowds, getting used to that, but the band, they also made me the playback engineer and the playback engineer for any touring act is the guy on the computer system that runs the tracks, right? Cause everyone has tracks now and it, it, the, these systems can run your cryo. It can run your pyro, the fire blast. It can run the light show on time code. So I'm the computer guy for Pop Roach and I'm going, well, I know a, I know how to run a show. I know how to run a big budget rock and roll show. Why don't I take that to my future hands project? And these parallels didn't really hit until like this last couple months because I, I, I'm taking, the band is taking this year off um, of touring. And so I'm thinking a lot about future hands. I'm like, let me grab everything I've learned from these guys and put it into my project and see what happens. Wow. I can't wait to be in on stage, or not, well, maybe actually on stage would be cool. But like in the crowd, uh, future hands, you're on stage, just going nuts. Um, ACL whole, 2025, yeah, I'm calling it. Let's go, ACL 2025. Just from a different perspective, I saw you with Pop Roach. That's great, but I'm going to see you on stage with future hands. And as a sales guy, of course, I want to know how are you going to grow the brand? And we understand that this is a long game, you know, yeah. and it's you're not expecting immediate results. But tactically, like how are you, how are you going to grow um, exposure and, and actually, you know, the, the reason that matters is b- being able to lift up more people and encourage people with your message and your music. So how are you going to approach it? So my approach to uh, marketing and promotion for Future Hands is content, short form content. I think that's the best way for a new artist to gain fans. And I'll tell you why. Because ads, sure, they could they could work i don't think they're as as beneficial because if you think about an ad it's very salesy and no one wants to be sold to so for instance if you're going through instagram and you're swiping and you see new artists after new artists like what's going to make you stop if the artist is saying hey pre-save pre-save link in my bio hey buy my album buy my t-shirt it's very salesy i feel like for me i would want to stumble up across the artist through a TikTok where they're being engaging and funny, maybe comedic, where I fall in love with them as a person before I find their music. Mm. You know what I mean? I want people to see me as Anthony, which is why I do vlogs. So I've been doing daily vlogs. I love that. Where it shows a completely organic side of me. I mean, my hair's messed up in these vlogs. I'm wearing my glasses. It's 6.30 in the morning. Like That's the real me. And I feel that if people see me and they go, hey, I like watching this dude's vlogs where he makes coffee and hangs with his girlfriend. Maybe they'll go to my music and then start being becoming a real fan. The thing I don't like as a viewer is when I'm swiping and I see a band go, pre-save, buy this, buy my merch, buy this. I'm like, why are you telling me to buy your stuff? I don't want now mm. I don't want to. You should be at a point where you've engaged with the person and and really like who they are, where you want to invest. You're like, oh man, this person just uh, seems so cool. Like I enjoy hanging out with them. And they've also brought a lot of value and entertainment. Like I want to invest in what they're doing. Yeah, and this this is me saying it from a brand new artist perspective. I would go out and make content, feed your fan base, give them what they want. People are on their phones to be entertained. These are entertainment apps, right? Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, they're entertainment apps. So if you're selling something to them, they're probably going to swipe past it. But if you do a comedic skit or you do a crazy basketball shot or you do something that makes them go, whoa, this guy's cool, they might convert into a fan of your music, right? So my whole plan is let me just put out content of me playing in my studio. Let me do behind the scenes content. Let me show them my life in these vlogs. And then cool. If you like my music, that's just a bonus, right? Yeah. Um, something to touch on with with business is the rule of seven 
which which in business for a long time, the rule of seven is someone needs to see your product at least seven times to make a purchase, Oh, right? People now, experts now, with our attention spans in this day and age, they think it's more along the lines of 30. Wow. Because our attention span is so limited now. We, You can't sit down at like a doctor's office or a subway shop without pulling your phone out and going on your, you know, your apps, like maybe within six seconds. So why is someone going to stop and look at your post while they're scrolling through? You have to make it engaging. You have to feed them. It can't just be a salesy post. That's, that's kind of my motto. That's my personal motto on promotion. Yeah. And where can people follow you for the vlog on YouTube? Like, can you uh, share with the audience if they want to? Yeah. The vlog is under future hands on YouTube. So you just type in future hands. Um, that that's where you will see my daily vlogs. I try to get one out a week. Um, once every two weeks is cool. probably pretty common, but, uh, future hands on all platforms, Spotify, TikTok, everything. You can just search that. Yeah, I know. It's fun to see with the vlogs and it's an honor to make some guest appearances. And I feel like, uh, you're creative and so fun and authentic in your content. And it, it's always, um, you know, fun for us to have the opportunity to collaborate on a podcast like this. And I feel like we should, uh, obviously we'll continue to make music together. Uh, more songs, EDM songs coming next. Yes, I'm excited Af- for after that. we launch Smile and Dial. The um, would you would you a uh, quick tangent? Would you consider Smile and Dial like is it 90s rock? Like how would you describe the the vibe? Yes, hundred um, percent. Smile and Dial is very third eye blind. Yeah, um, but it's kind of got a country twang to it. It does. Uh, what's the other bands I'm thinking of? Oh, uh, Matchbox Twenty. Yeah. It's kind of Matchbox uh, 20. It really is. So uh, pumped to do more content with you, man. Um, so I wanted to finish up talking about like um, independent artists. So you're passionate about this. Yeah. Like what what does it mean to be an independent artist? And it seems like that's the route you're taking. And tell us, tell us all about it. Well, really like what sparked the whole independent artist route is when I started realizing how record companies and record labels really in the past are out to screw you. I mean, and not all of them. I'm not going to make this blanket statement that all record labels are evil. It's not true. There's some that are awesome. But a lot of them know what they're doing in the sense where they will sign you uh, and give you, you know, they dangle the carrot with an advance. So most artists are starving artists. They don't make money. So the second a label has interest in you and they go, hey, we'll give you $50,000, $100,000 advance so that you can live on this money and create more music. Most people sign that away immediately. But what they're signing away is 80% of their rights to their music, to their touring. Um, A 360 deal is a very common deal in the record, or it was a very common deal in the record label world, where essentially 360 means you have to recoup that advance before you see any money on your own music sales. So I was like looking into different deals and going, do I want to get signed? Do I want to be with the label? Maybe one day, because labels can be helpful. Um, But right now, You have everything you need on your iPhone. You market yourself, like I just talked about, on TikTok and Instagram. You don't need a label to do that. And labels and management companies are just going to tell you to do that anyway. So you might as well just do it on your own and see what happens. Um, And anyone can be an independent artist these days. There are websites such as Canva.com. Canva is a website where you can make your own album artwork. You can make uh, banners for your Twitch stream. You can make banners for YouTube. I think it's nine bucks a month. Dude, I use Canva for my course, actually. Like and how all great of the is decks. It? It's amazing. It's, it is it's, such a good platform. It's a tool for artists. Because here's the thing uh, a graphic designer will charge a grand, two grand, five grand to make a album, piece of album artwork. You can make it for nine bucks on Canva, right? Um, pluginboutique.com is a plugin website for producers, and they give free plugins. You don't got to go buy $200 packs of strings and keys. It's free on Plugin Boutique. Um, what else do I use? Artless.io is yeah. a website where you can make music videos. 5K, 4K, 6K, beautifully shot um, film that you can download royalty-free, and you can make your own music video. So instead of going and paying someone ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, you're making it for nine ninety nine a month. So that's, once I discovered all these things, I'm like, why not just grind and do it myself? And then one day a label would be a great partnership. But for now, I'm just going to see what I can do. 
Mm, you're putting in the work today uh, in faith, trusting in yourself and not selling out to a big label, but like being patient and waiting for the right opportunity. And learning just, the facets of the industry and learning how to do it myself first so that when I do partner with someone, I have some insight on mm, the business, right? I think like a aspect of greatness, like in studies have shown this is delayed gratification like and being patient and you have embodied that today it's cool just talking with you and it's just naturally coming out like all the ways that you are willing to be patient and just take steps towards a long-term vision knowing that good things take time so they do uh, i love your approach man like we hit on so much stuff like we were entertained with like music i put you on the spot and you just crushed it um inside and inspiration uh i'm excited about future hands man i Thanks, can't wait bro. to see you on stage at acl oh, and man. um that's oh, the dream 2025 any other um final calls to action for the audience or words of encouragement as we um, wrap up this conversation i mean just whatever your thing is you know Find what you love to do and and stick with it. Just don't give up on it. Because like we talked about, there's highs and lows. And I feel like the people that win in all these industries are the people that don't ever stop. So pick a time each day, carve out a time each day to work on your passion and just do it for the next year and put it online. I guess, you know, my, my favorite motto right now is done is better than perfect. Mm. You can spin your wheels on your art form and, and say it's not ready. It's not done yet. It could be better. Yeah, it could be better, but then it'll never get put out. So I encourage people to just put it out. When you get it to a place, whatever it is, if you're a painter and the paintings, it, it makes, if you feel something when you look at the painting, it's done. If you feel something good when you listen to your song you produced, it's done. Go to distrokid.com, go to tunecore.com. It's nine bucks. It distributes to all platforms. You're done. It's out. The world can hear it. So just know that you could make things better, but the world doesn't really know. They just want to hear what you have and see what you have. So put it out. Dude, I have to say, like, I'm launching my course, Tech Sales Accelerator, and that's, like, exactly what I needed to hear. And to the audience out there, like, whatever your projects are, big or small, like, get it out there. And think about what are you going to use your two hands, you know, to, <laughs> to build? Like, how are you going to shape a, a better future tomorrow, like... Anthony, what uh, what an inspiration, man! Like, thank you for being an amazing friend, pushing me to be better, like helping me uh, step into my greatness just by way of you doing that yourself. Thank you for sharing with this audience today. This was a fun one, man. This was. Thank you for having me, man, and uh, thank you for all that you do for me and for the people of YouTube. And I love you, buddy. I love you, man. Seriously. And you people of YouTube, thank you for being here. I hope you were entertained. This put a smile on your face. And please check out Future Hands. I've linked um, the link to Spotify. I've also linked Anthony's um, vlog for you to check out on YouTube. You won't regret it. In fact, it'll lift your spirits. And um, guys, to your success in tech sales and in life, happy selling and happy living. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye.